Drew, I have to admit, like, how I found you was very much by chance. I was on Facebook and, you know, I'm just scrolling along, scrolling along. And then all of a sudden I see this guy in his car just singing a bunch of different reggaeton songs. And at first I'm like, okay, it's a passing video. Cool, I liked it. And I kept moving on. Days later pass on and I see another one. And I see another one. And I'm seeing all my other friends really digging your stuff. So I'm like, all right, you know what? Let me see if I can reach out to Drew and see if I can talk to him a little because I found it very interesting. And then the more I learned about you, the more I kind of thought, all right, this is a pretty interesting guy. Now, how I usually like to get started is to kind of start at the beginning. And I know that you were born and raised in New York. What was that experience like for you growing up in, in New York? Uh, New York was great. Well, New York is New York, so New York is always going to be a crazy city, but I, I was raised in the Bronx specifically, did a lot of my childhood over at Jamaica Ave in Queens. Um, when I was in the Bronx, I lived on Kingsbridge in Jerome, and uh, and just growing up there was just, you know, you, you got your thugs, your drug dealers, and stuff like that. Um, so when we moved out to Queens, it was kind of to get away from that, but my mother was, she moved us in with her boyfriend who happened to have been an abusive one so uh so yeah just living in that in that house and that environment for me i was always outside I, I just couldn't be inside i was always outside sports playing graffiti and and bmx bikes and rollerblades and even the gangs and stuff like that we had our not gangs but we had our little clicks and back in my back in my day you know the the the, the handshakes and stuff was was like <laughs> everything out there so we had our little click and stuff and growing up I was always involved with music um the hooky parties after uh, not going to school going to hooky parties always play so stuff like that just growing up a majority of my family was from the Washington Heights area Dykeman and stuff like that like and they're still there so so uh, just being raised in that culture and that environment on my father's side of the family was where I pick up this love for reggaeton. Absolutely. And, and that passion of like listening to reggaeton music. And that's not to like, I, I, I do with a lot of old school reggaeton, but that's not to say I don't love the new stuff coming out. I love the new stuff coming out. Anuel, Bad Bunny, J Balvin, Ozuna, all these people. I just love them. And, and your family is Dominican? Origins? Okay. All right. Well, then that makes all the sense in the world, obviously. Yeah. Um, now, it's obviously, at least from, from what you just said, it seems like your upbringing was a lot of fun. But at the same time, there was some struggles and there were some, like you said, you lived maybe around some people that weren't doing the best things in the world. Um, did you have anyone in your life that kind of helped you kind of stay on that, on that, you know, on that <laughs> you know, path that you're not going to go and tip over and maybe do something that you might regret? No. Um, and, and that's not to say that my mother is a big inspiration to me because, you know, growing up watching her struggle and just maintain a roof over our head, there was a time where we, where we almost went homeless, where she didn't have a place to go. So, um, but uh, for me, just uh, watching that perseverance it's inspiring, but it's it's not a life I would I would say you know I, I would follow either. You know what I'm saying? Because it's a life of struggle and stuff like that. And I think we all try to minimize the the amount of struggle that's in that's in each of our lives. Um, but as far as you know, perseverance and stuff like that, and 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 just keeping your head straight and just knowing that you have responsibilities here is I definitely credit my mother for that. My father was in our it was in my life along with my brother and stuff like that. We saw him every weekend, and and for me, he's he's the kind of role model dad that I would aspire to be because he he was never abusive or anything like that. Um, 
but he did have a limit with goals that he that he would want to reach that and never did so for me it's i have this idea of sky's the limit you can reach your goals and a lot of times for people is that they never get that inch of success in the goals that they're trying to accomplish and a lot of times people just tend to give up and i always tell everyone all, all you need is that one inch to work hard and continue working at it but as soon as you get that one inch that one inch forward it's like sky's the limit it's like holy shit okay i can do this actually hmm. let me get to that other inch let me try to get a foot next time you know what i'm saying yeah. and uh and 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 it's not to throw shit at my family it's just it's just not a lot of them would have that kind of mentality to push forward. So but if, if anything, I think when you, you look at it in hindsight, I think growing up, maybe the way that you did kind of yeah. set you up in this path to be the Drew that you are today in many respects, I think. Yeah. Um, now, going a little bit back into high school where you kind of touched on you, I think you said the BMX, biking, uh, music, all these other things. In high school, were you kind of like the jock? Were you kind of the funny guy? Were you, what, you mentioned the graffiti thing. What were you in high school? I was athletic. I was freakishly good at everything I played. Um, basketball, baseball. I had like this this talent of baseball where I, I could hit anything and I can catch anything. It was, it was insane. Um, um, handball was a big part of my life. It, it, it was one of the reasons why I continued to cut school, which is ironic because, you know, it's like the school had teens, mm -hmm. but I just never had the grades that they let me in. So for me, it was kind of, all right, then I'm going to school. I'm going to go play at the park. Fuck this. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was, I was, I was the athletic one. I was, I was always, and I was, oh, I always wanted to get better at whatever I felt I was weak at. And that was like, for me, it was kind of like, and when I saw myself getting better, it was this addiction that I had to try to be better than better. How can I be the best I can be in? And, and yeah, and I did that with sports a lot. I tried to, I tried to like join like city teams and stuff. And a lot of them had age gaps or so my mother just couldn't afford to put me in these teams to buy the uniforms. So I'd lie a lot and just be like, yeah, no, I'm 13. I'm like 17 years old. No, I'm 13. I'm, yeah, I'm 13. Just freaking crossing everyone up, <laughs> all these kids. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it is what it is. And, you know, I, I never got far with it. it well, then, I just got good at it. <laughs> so since you were more of the athletic type in high school, was your kind of persistence to find kind of excellence in sports kind of that first – did you get that first hint that, all right, you're the type of person who kind of, whatever you get involved in, you kind of put everything into, sort of? Was that like your first hint of it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was just, uh, it was, it was addicting for me. The fact that I know I can be better at it, it, it became, it, be, it became nothing else mattered. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like nothing else mattered. Like I hate seeing a weakness in me. And I say that with age now because I know the older I get, the the weaker I am at other things where I just don't have the energy as I did before to tackle on something. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it just growing up teenager and even in my 20s, if I found myself weak at something, I, I have this thing where I got to figure it out. I got to figure it out. It's like Mayweather says, you know, and Mayweather always puts like a downer on it. It's like you're a master at everything, put an ex, you know, put an expert at nothing and stuff. And I find nothing wrong with that. I, I think I think being a master at, 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 at or like good at everything, but a master at nothing. And I feel like being good at everything just well, well rounds people in their ability to reach out and expand and do different things and still be good at it. Yeah, and it makes you someone who's more um, needed by people in general, in workplaces and everything. Like if you're a jack of all trades, yeah. you're going to always be, you're always going to find something to get involved in, always. Now, one thing that I didn't want to talk to you about is, so usually the track for most kids is, after high school, you go to college. Your route was very different where from at the end of high school, you decided to join the military. When you made that, that transition, what was kind of the motivation fact, motivational factor to get into that? And, you know, how, how did your family kind of react to you making that move? Um, I was bored. 
all of my friends had left to the military and I was just, I was alone. I was bored and I didn't have nothing to do. I saw a commercial and just got curious, went to a recruiter's office. It's just like, well, what can you offer me here? I had no experience in the military besides knowing that my friends left. None of my family members, I'm the first and I'm still the last in my family member to join the military. And, uh, and the recruiter was able to push it up and, and just convince me to take a certain MOS, a specific job. And I did that. I signed up and I was already an adult by that time. So I didn't need permission by my parents and stuff. And when I did it, kind of didn't realize what I was getting into. Uh, just one night I went, showed up, my mom was cooking. I'm like, hey, um, so I'm leaving in two weeks. Just yeah. like yeah, yeah, just like that. She was like, well, where are you going? And I'm like, because my mom, she knows me for just getting up and going places. Like, there's times I've ended up in Tennessee, Florida, and she's like, what the hell are you doing over there? Okay. Long story. Yeah. Long- <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she where do you where are you going? And so I joined the military, and she didn't believe me. She goes, Mira, uh-huh, mm, okay, mm-hmm. Like, no, I'm, I joined the military. I'm leaving in two weeks. Long story short, there was there was nothing she can do. And at that time, there was nothing I could do to stop it. It was already signed. It was already a signed deal. I was leaving anyways. And um, and yeah, I um it was something she had to accept and and she knew there was nothing there was nothing left for me in the hood anymore. So she she kind of she kind of accepted it and was just like, all right, do your thing. Okay. And and how many years were you in the military? Five years. Five years. And yeah. then it, for me, it's kind of crazy because I'm, I'm trying to like piece your life together, right? From like New York, your upbringing, high school, the military. And then I look at your social media career and I have your numbers here, at least the last minute numbers. You have 28,000 subscribers on YouTube. You have over a million followers on Facebook. You have 181 on Instagram. Your videos keep getting viral. How did you make that transition from, okay, you're doing your, your stuff in the military, you finish up in the military. What happens once you, you finish? Do you go back to New York? Do you go to LA? What, what happens? What, what, where, how do you fill in that gap? The karaoke videos for me are fun. They're, they're, they're a moment of expressive, of being expressive towards things that I like in general, music that I like, music that I want to see come back, music that I just don't want to see fade away. Mm-hmm. You know? And that's not to say that people today are, you know, still rocking the, the daddy Yankee romping and, and, and not, you know what I'm saying? Oh. But it, it's, it's one of those things where, where it's, a, it's a feeling of when you're reminded of things in the past when things weren't so hectic as they are, bef- uh, as they are now that you can, you can sit back and enjoy a, a bit of remembrance of, of when times were a little bit better. Mm. And for me, that's like that feeling, especially when I'm putting it together, where it's just like, that's great. Sometimes when I go live, I'm playing Hector Lavoe, El Cantante, and, and, and Celia Cruz and stuff, you know, because these, these are time, timeless music, you know, they're going to forever live. And, uh, and, and just going back, just having that feeling of, you know, times are good. Times are good. When, when yeah, I, I think in general for me, I think the, what, how I rationalize it with the way you're saying is like, for me, with my family here in Miami, because I'm based in Miami, my family, whenever we had get togethers, they would always play music I'd never heard before from like their era. Right. And it didn't matter if the party was five years afterwards, 10 years afterwards, it doesn't matter. The same music would be playing. It was like yeah. you go into a time machine and it's the same music again and again. So I feel as we get older, we're kind of doing the exact same thing, but with our with the music of our generation in many respects. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I completely agree with that. It's kind of like the social media period, you know, when social media starts booming, your parents are like, "Qué eso? No juego con eso, es un disparate." Yeah, esa computadora que te va, you know what I'm saying? It's like the games, you know, stay off of the games. And uh, and I think I think we're at that, or at least uh, I'm at that point where this new generation, there's so much pressure on them to grow up so fast. You know what I'm saying? That back then it was just like things were easier. Back then things were cool, mm-hmm. things were cool. But you know, just give the props that this generation right here started. <laughs> 
a lot of this internet stuff. <laughs> well, well, one thing I, I definitely want to ask you. So when you finished up in the military, what was your next move? Did you go back home to New York? Did you, how did you kind of figure out that, all right, I want to go more into the entertainment world? I was lost, man even the military and i think a lot of veterans feel that way um i was lost in what do i do now with my life now that i have nothing else to do you know and just trying to find that purpose i ended up going to college and uh, college wasn't working for me i think my first semester i thought college was a joke um i just finessed my way to a b in a class people were failing and i figured out you know some tricks to getting a higher grade and not necessarily test results and attendance and stuff like that you know it's all important but there's ways around your grades that you can and when i realized that for me it was just like i can't take this serious i can't take college serious i think it's a joke and i ended up leaving college i was doing college business administration just trying to figure out what i want to do because i was working at a bank at the time and uh, i figured business administration would probably be towards a direction of maybe something else. And uh, and yeah, I was working at a bank, going to school. School was a joke to me. I wasn't taking my job at the bank seriously. And then I saw the, the president uh, drive by in his motorcade, a bunch of black trucks. Cause I worked, at, uh, I worked in downtown Manhattan, right across the street from the UN. And you know, they always had like UN meetings and stuff like that there. And when I saw the president drive by, I was like, holy shit, that's the coolest thing ever. That right there's the coolest thing ever. And uh, and I decided to be a private contractor for the Department of State after that. I used my military experience. I knew I qualified for some jobs, and uh, I, I took a I took a contract in Iraq in Baghdad, and did that for a couple years. And that's pretty much where my social media thing started. Wow! <laughs> that, that, look, man, had you given me like a pop quiz and told me, "Hey, these are the options. Which one do you think Drew took?" I would have never picked that one. I would have never, I, college I could, I could buy into, the bank I could buy into, but becoming a contractor and doing all that, would have never guessed that. I would have never guessed that. Yeah, I was a private contractor security for a lot of the diplomats that were out there. So I became exactly what I saw was the guys in the black trucks. And mm -hmm. it was a fun job. It was a relaxing job for me. I took that, that job because it paid so well as an opportunity of vacation and stack money in the banks. Like, mm -hmm. like my job in Baghdad was a vacation for me to get away from like all this hecticness that's happening out here. Life is so simple. They got your food ready. They got your housing ready. All you gotta do is show up to work over there and not pay anything. So it was just like, this is a vacation out here, it's cool. But then obviously th that does sound pretty good. A vacation doesn't sound bad. <laughs> but I think at, at some point, I think all of us, at our workplace or whatever it is, you want to never feel like you're just going to work because you have to. You want to do it because it's your passion to do it. And I think when we look, anybody who goes on your page, anyone who sees the stuff that you do, your passion is in that. I think your passion is in all the videos that you make, all the funny videos, the music videos, whatever it is, that's where your passion lies. So after you did that and you were a contractor for that period of time, when did you kind of figure out, hey, if I actually start playing up this this social media, you know, forum, whatever you want to call it, and kind of try and figure my figure out my niche, I can make this kind of a full time thing for myself. So I, I think it, 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 that falls in line with the goals that I want to accomplish. Like I'm in Los Angeles, based actor out here, writer. And sometimes I assume the mantle of director. Not that I want to do that. It's just if, if it needs to get done and I need to go out and learn how to do it and stuff like that, I'm going to go do it. And, and like I said, it's also it's one of those things where if it's a weakness for me, I got to get better at it. And I got to keep doing it. Um, and social media, what I saw and what pays out, especially for my videos, is that the videos gives me the opportunity to continue acting without having to worry about finding work out here finding a job and stuff so the social media for me keeps me comfortable out here enough where i can continue being creative in the areas that i want to spend the rest of my life doing i realized i'm a content creator i create content for facebook and and youtube and stuff like that and for me i feel like social media is the devil of society you know what I'm saying? It's like there's too much information out here. 
Two people are, people are way too opinionated now. It's one of those things, but I realize that, okay, I'm a content creator. I make, I make videos. I make videos to make people feel good or, or to reminisce on good times and stuff. So I've settled with the idea, this is what I'm going to do. This is what I want to provide. And in exchange for that, like people do with their jobs, because at work, you exchange time for money. In exchange for that, what I'm going to do is work on something I want to spend my life doing, and that's acting. And, and that's how I'm able to settle with the idea so that it doesn't drive me insane. Because just thinking about, well, where's my future going to be if I continue making these videos? I don't want to be a 45-year-old man in, in a car, you know, just, yep. just like, yeah, no, I want to get somewhere <laughs> where it's like career-based, something where I can still be creative and, and still live a, a, a life where I know I can be proud of, of the work I've done. Mm. Now, social media can turn off tomorrow. Mm-hmm. And what am I left with at that point? That's true. So um, now one thing that I, I'm curious to ask you now, because you're a person who's very persistent in the things that you kind of want to accomplish and do. But if you were to compare to sports, right? Like if you're doing baseball, if you had a game and you were two for three, that's a good game. Right. If, you know, you scored 20 on a basketball game, you, you can see it analytically. All right, I'm doing good. Stats can show you're doing good. But with acting, that's very subjective. You know, depending on the audience that sees you, you're going to get different reactions. How do you kind of get better in that field? Or how do you judge your progress when it's so dependent on audiences? Man, I am my worst critic. I'm never good enough. I'm never, I'm acting puts me at a place where it's like, I can do better. Hmm. What were you thinking here? I can do way better than this. Hmm. And it, it just, it just drives me to continue doing better. And I was talking about this yesterday with, with my cousin, where I, I think I realized at a point in my life that I'm just never going to be happy with results. I'm always going to be unhappy with my results. And henceforth, I'm, I'm going to continue to try hard. And it's, it's, I guess that's a little bit alarming because it's just like, well, where, when's your happy place hitting, right? It's just like, that's life, man. That's the journey. That's life at, at some point. Why would I want to settle for like, for what I feel like, ah, this is the best I can do. You can always do better. So, but then so do you ever take a moment then to kind of just reflect a little bit on where you started looking back in, in when you were a kid in New York to where you are now in LA do you ever take a moment to reflect and be like, wow, this was a really long journey and, you know, look where I'm at now. Do you ever kind of take a moment to look back? You don't. Is, is, there, is it just a particular reason where you just don't want to look back? I don't, I don't, I don't look back. For me, it's, it's kind of it's like, what, what does that do for me? You know what I'm saying? I can look back and say, you know, I, I've realized where I, I, I know where I come from. I realize where I come from and I realize the struggle it took to get where I'm at and where I continue to, to, to head towards. But I still got to look forward at the end of the day. You know, if somebody, if somebody wants to talk about my past, go ahead and talk about my, you know what I'm saying? But for me right now at this moment, I'm thinking about what am I doing tonight? I'm working on my scripts tonight. That's, that's what I'm focused on right now. But but I never, I don't really, I don't really, my goal is the future. My goal is to give my mother back time. She spent, you know, trying to, you know, she spent raising us, mm -hmm. you know? So, so until I'm there, until I'm there receiving an award with my mother watching me, I'm never looking back. That right there, I can look at her. I can look at her, not say a word and she knows. But I think that, even, even you wouldn't be complacent with that. I feel if we're going to get to where you're not even going to be complacent about that, honestly. True. True. But it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a check. It's a check off the old list. Mm -hmm. it, that's, that's a check at the old, at, at, at the list. So the, the more you kind of describe it, it does seem to me, cause again, I'm, I love baseball, love basketball. That's a baseball player's mentality. You know, you have to have quick memory. You can't be thinking about your last at bat where you struck yeah. out. You kind of have to think about the next one and you kind of have to yeah. focus on the next game. Yeah. So talking about the present right now, when, before we started the interview, you were telling me a little bit that you were, you were working in the process of exporting uh, a brand new movie and whatnot. What, what are you working on right now without obviously giving us too much information? Cause obviously it's still in the process of being made, but 
What are you working on? So I, I did a horror comedy here. I got a bunch of friends here and it's for Halloween. It'll be out tomorrow. Um, the, these small moments for me are, are work on the acting chops, work on the acting chops, you know, always stay working. I have a problem with waiting for an audition. I hate it. I don't like, I don't like the fact that I got to wait for somebody to give me an opportunity. Mm. I, I'm, I'm a self-starter. I got to go do this. I, I can't. And a lot of people in LA do that. And you know, that's just the typical norm out here in Los Angeles. You audition, audition. That's like your life. Audition, auditioning is an actor's job. Getting the role is, all right, cool. You got it already. You know, now let's work. Um, what I want to do ultimately out here is I want to represent for Latinos specifically. Mm -hmm. um, there, was, there was one moment when I had just gotten out here and I'm looking at the roles, the amount of roles that are here and I'm just skimming through them. And I see the, 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 the types that they're looking for, drug dealer, we're looking for blacks or Latinos, um, thugs, blacks or Latinos. It's never doctors, you know, or cops, cops, blacks or Latinos. It's never doctors, it's never lawyers, stuff like that. So I'm just like, I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna do that. You know, I don't wanna do that. Like for me, it's like, where are the, where are the superheroes out here? Where, where, are, the, where are the storytellers? Where are the, the big, the big uh, character arch over here that are important? So, and that's one of the reasons why I started focusing on writing. Cause if I want to, if I want to write something that's compelling, I need to know how to write script and stuff like that. And I took a few years to learn how to write it, to work, to learn how to structure my scripts and storytelling. And what I realized is the goal that I want to do out here is represent for Latinos and write stories that Latinos can look at and be like, yeah, that's, that's dope right there. That's dope. I saw a guy, he was a gamer. He played the Spider-Man games and the Spider-Man had like an alternate reality where the kid was Puerto Rican from Harlem. And you, have you seen it? Yeah, Miles Morales, right? Yeah. And the dude just broke down. He was just like, he realized how important representation is because he saw himself there. He saw a mirror of himself. And I was just like, that's, that's a beautiful moment. Like, how do you, you know? And I get it. I understood that. So for me, it's, it's just like, like, I, I just want to represent it. For me, I got this uh, script that we're going to start doing and I want to do it entirely in Mexico. And, it, and, and it's a vigilante story. It's about a Latino who's, whose parents get killed in a mugging and he's out for vengeance. He's out, he's out to settle the score a bit and he has some crooked cops that are after him that are willing to do whatever to take him down. Hmm. And, and, and for me, it's just, it, it's like a, I look at the story like a superhero origin. You yeah. know, like, he's not a superhero, he's just a regular guy, but he's just, you know, his parents and, and a Latino family, you know, your parents are the most important people in your life, especially if you don't have kids. But do you, so. do you feel at least the tide is changing a little bit? With that, because I think what you're mentioning of where the Latinos in general, they're, they're kind of put into one box when it comes to mm -hmm. Hollywood in general. Do you feel at least a little bit that that's changing or do you feel that the change is just too slow? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I would want to see more roles for my nappy headed Latinos. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Latinos we usually see are very slick haired, just combed back or long. And you know, how often do you see a Latino with nappy hair? You know, that Tego Calderon, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I want to see more shine to my darker brothers, you know, my darker brothers and sisters and the, the nappy headed ones. I had I had I had a friend who was casting for a role of a Latino. It was just like, oh, he has like slick hair. I'm like, why why you got big slick hair? Why just have nappy hair, you know? And I think myself breaking that stigma. I have nappy hair, huh? I think it's just like breaking that stigma a little bit. Yeah, I think. yeah. But I, I do think that there are, there are, there are some opportunities that are opening up. But I feel like it's on us to write our stories too. We can't just, we can't just be complacent and wait for people to give us the opportunity. Everyone has the opportunity to write the story of the character they want to be, and you can do it. Absolutely, absolutely. And last thing that I want to ask you is. At least from what I've learned from you today in this interview, is that you could have very easily, once you had left the military and started that contractor job, gotten completely complacent and said, "Hey, I'm making good money. It's it's like a, a little vacation. The work isn't too crazy. You could have just relaxed and chilled for God knows ten, fifteen, twenty years, 
doing the same thing, but you weren't passionate there and you went for your passion. And I think there are so many people, you know, who are in a position right now where they're looking at their lives and they're, they might be making good money or maybe they're stuck and they're thinking, well, maybe I think I have to go just for the stable job as opposed to maybe my passion. What would you say to those people who are in that, that middle ground where they don't know whether to go for what's stable or go for what their passion is? What would you tell them? Mm, that depends on the risk. Um, Cause people have responsibilities, you know, kids, maintaining that roof over their heads and stuff like that. Um, listen to your gut is, is a big thing for me. I listen to my gut with everyone I meet, with every single person. It's, it's how I hire people, actually. I don't care about qualifications. I care about who you are as a person and where's your mind at for this project. I've met people where they're more concerned about the payment they get for this, which is cool. If you're all about your money, cool. I would rather be around people that are in it creatively. And if there's a budget to even raise your salary, I'm going to do that. I've done it before. I've paid people more than what they've asked for because it's in the budget. But, I've hi- but that's specifically for me. I've hired people that are just like their first question is tell me, talk to me about this project. We talk about the project and we talk about the goals for the project. And I think for people, you need to listen to your gut. If this is something where you feel in your gut like there's something else here, I'm not fully happy. Because that's where I was. I was making six figures out there. And I wasn't happy. I was just like, I feel like I'm wasting my life. Like all of a sudden money had nothing to do with it. It was the reason why I went out there. And all of a sudden it had nothing to do with it. And, and I felt like there's something more. And, and I got this, my gut's telling me, you're going to have to take, you're going to have to roll this dice. Leaving it, I almost went homeless, almost in the street. I was 30 years old. I had to go back to my mom's house, bro. I, for me, it was just like I left my mom's house at 19 when I went to the military, never went back. 30 years old, I'm coming back to my mom's house. I got nothing in the bank anymore. Just like, coño, me quedé jodido aquí. I'm fucking stuck. You know, this is the worst place ever right now. I love my mom to death, you know. But for me, it's just like I, I can't be here. I, I, need, I, didn't leave a, I didn't leave a high-paying job, which I can't go back to at that point. So. And it and and it, it ended up working out for me. I had to I had to really uh, screw my head on tight, figure out a way to do this, and I was able to do it. And um, and that that and that's the risk and that everyone's gonna take. And you can't be afraid of risk. You cannot not, not be afraid. We take risk over here all the time. It's almost incredible the amount of risk that we take. Where it's just like I can't believe we we still got money to pay rent right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, but I I like to believe God got me and you got to believe in God and you got to trust your instincts because those are the, those are the main two things that are going to lead you to success and be patient, be patient, 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 because it's never going to come when you want it to come. I think that's very, again, man, that's a very inspiring way to look at it because I think life is all full of ups and downs. And right when you think you're, you're down for good, there's going to be an opportunity that comes up to help you get up again. So again, Drew, thank you so much. But before I let you go, do you want to plug anything, man? Where can we watch the Halloween movie? Uh, is it going to be on YouTube? Is it going to be on Facebook? Where can we watch it? Or is it going to be on Amazon? Where? Where can we see yeah, it? It's, it's going to be on YouTube and Facebook. Um, so it's going to be free to watch. It's something we did for fun, like I mentioned. And it was it was kind of like a give back. Like, check out what we did here. You know, have mm-hmm. fun. Enjoy it. It's a pretty cool cool film we got we got a a series on amazon called heist they're really short mini episodes two three minutes long um but it's it's it it was another thing where we was just like let's do this got a bunch of friends together we did that we did orisha a film about about the yoruba faith and santeria you would say Uh, santeros might not agree with it fair warning you might not want to watch that one (laughs) But it was, it was, I'm a big horror guy. I'm a big comedy guy. And if I'm diving in between the two, I want to pull out, I want to put out the most unique thing that's never been done. And I haven't seen anything done on the Orishas. Mm. So it, it was just a creative moment for me to, you know, express a little bit and just have fun with it. Um, so yeah, you can watch that also on Amazon. So Absolutely. Again, Drew, thank you so much for your time. And I know you're a very, very busy guy. Thank you for your time, man. I think uh, I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of this interview. So thank you, man. Appreciate you. I appreciate your time, man. Thank you for having me.